dive into Stephen A's relationship with ESPN with the man himself and get an inside look at college football with one of its most famous reporters. Plus, the Manning cast hit an all-time low, Steph Curry wants to own an NBA team, and Chelsea is in talks to leave Stamford Bridge where they've played since 1905. It's Thursday, September 12th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we're hearing from Stephen A. Smith, who spoke with senior writer Michael McCarthy at our Tuned In Live event in New York. Plus, I spoke with Marty Smith about the ever-changing landscape of college football, and Alex Schiffer joins to break down an all-time low for the Manning cast. First, let's hit today's headlines. The NFL set a record for the most viewers during week one of any season. The league averaged 21 million viewers per game, with a total of at least 123 million people tuning in to watch at least part of a game last week. The NFL started off strong, drawing in a record 29.2 million people for its kickoff game between the Ravens and the Chiefs, and never slowed down from there. Meanwhile, Monday's Manning cast hit an all-time low of 872,000 average viewers, despite rolling out a guest lineup of Bill Belichick, Adam Sandler, and Kansas City Chiefs star defensive tackle Chris Jones. Mauricio Pochettino is officially the next head coach of the U.S. men's national team. The 52-year-old replaces Greg Berhalter and will manage a national team for the first time in his career. Speaking of high-profile coaching deals finally getting done, Michigan finally inked Sharon Moore to replace Jim Harbaugh as head coach. Moore has already been coaching the Wolverines for two weeks and agreed to take the job in January, but the deal got caught up in the details until Wednesday when the team announced it. The initial deal was reportedly for five years, $30 million. The final deal is similar. It's over five years with a base salary of half a million, plus $5 million in additional compensation in year one, with small increases each year after. He also has some job security in the form of a $5 million buyout that drops by $1 million each season. Fanatics has halted all orders of its sports merchandise to Australia over a trademark dispute. In July, an Australian federal court ruled that Fanatics infringed on trademarks belonging to local sports travel company, Fan Firm, to which Fanatics responded with a statement that read, Until further notice, Fanatics is no longer fulfilling orders from or otherwise selling slash shipping goods to customers in Australia. Fanatics has since filed an appeal to the Australian court. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver said that the NBA's Board of Governors will take on the topic of expansion this season. Now that the league has secured its new $76 billion media deals, it can get serious about adding two teams. Well, many view it as a foregone conclusion that Seattle and Las Vegas will get a team sometime this decade, Silver said that the league hasn't yet committed to expanding at all, let alone figuring out which markets it's targeting. Stephen A. Smith is one of the most recognizable faces in sports media, and he has a looming decision to make about whether or not to stay with ESPN. Smith was very candid about that when he spoke with senior writer Michael McCarthy at our Tuned In Live event in New York City. They also got into a ton of other topics. I think you'll really enjoy this one. Here's Mike's conversation with Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A., welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here. It's good to be here. What's going on, man? Um, ever since Sunday, you've been all over this Tyreek Hill arrest. Yeah. And you've been talking about it on your show, you've been talking about it on your podcast. Now that you've had a chance to talk to some folks who are involved and you've seen the police tape, what is your take? Wasn't happy with it, obviously. Um, I, don't, I don't ever say police brutality. I say brutality on the part of some police officers because I don't want to castigate the entire, you know, uh, industry of, of police officers and what have you. I mean, I know that for the most part, most of them protect and serve and they fulfill their obligations and their oath. And I certainly don't want to be one of those people that are irresponsible enough to just paint everybody with a broad brush as a black man. I don't want, I don't want us as black people being stigmatized that way. So I, I, in the interest of fairness, I try to make sure I do the same thing. Um, but I do believe those police officers were a bit excessive. I do believe this, they have a responsibility to, to, de, to de-escalate a situation. I don't think they did that. But I also expressed on first take this morning that I was a little upset at Tyreek Hill because my initial reaction was what it was based on the video that we saw. But then when we saw the video in its entirety, right. that was released by the, uh, you know, the Florida Police Department and the Benevolent Association, um, he was uncooperative. When you get pulled over by police, you roll down your damn windows. You don't roll your windows up. When they tell you to roll down your windows, you roll down your windows. When they tell you to hand you their license, they tell you to hand, you hand them your license. And if they ask you to get out the car, you get out the vehicle. And those were all things that he hesitated in doing. And so on one hand, as my colleague at ESPN, Dominic Foxworth, articulated accurately so, the responsibility and the onus 
does primarily fall on law enforcement officials, and that's true, and you want to make sure the focus belongs there. But in the same breath, what you also want to make sure is you want to do what you can to contribute to lives being saved. And how he conducted himself at the beginning, well, what if the officers panicked because you kept the windows up and they were fearful of what was on the other side of that glass? And that caused them to act wrong. That's something that you have to be careful about, and I think you have to take that into consideration. So again, the primary, primarily the onus is on them, and I don't take back anything I said about those police officers because they didn't serve to de-escalate the situation. But Tyreek Hill wasn't perfect in the scenario, and I wouldn't encourage anybody, especially any black man that's pulled over by the police to act the way that he acted initially because you might get yourself hurt. And you also noted that there was a difference between his arrest and Scotty Scheffler's. Of course. Scotty Scheffler was uh, walked away. Tyreek was put on the ground. Yeah. To white America, that's usually, the, that's usually how it goes. And y'all need to understand that. It's easier to dehumanize African-American men. The proof is in the pudding. Scotty Scheffler was handcuffed. He was detained. He was taken away. He was arrested. But he wasn't thrown to the ground in 93-degree weather with that asphalt, your face stuck on there. He wasn't lifted up with handcuffs behind his back and then forcibly put back down in the seating position. That did not happen to him. And so there's one thing, one incident where it involves law enforcement making the decision to enforce the law, and then there's another incident where you had law enforcement officials that did so, but in a more excessive fashion. And that's the kind of things that black folks, particularly black men, usually uh, articulate and usually highlight. Uh, Front Office Sports recently asked Jimmy Pataro and Burke Magnus both about the state of your contract negotiations. Yep. Uh, if you don't know, Stephen A's contract is up in 2025. They both said they very much want to stay in business with you mm -hmm. uh, as the face of ESPN. Any news you can give us on the negotiations? Not a word. There's <laughs> nothing I can do. They, you know, they've made an offer. I've countered. Um, and that's where we've left it. Yeah. And so, you know, my contract ends in June of 2025. Uh, Disney, the Disney family, I have a great relationship with Bob Iger, uh, who's been incredible to me. Um, Jimmy Pataro is a great man, one of the nicest people you'd ever meet in your life. I'm still getting to know Burke Magnus, uh, who obviously runs ESPN, and he's doing a damn good job. I don't think anybody can deny that at this particular moment in time. Uh, but they have their vision, and I have mine. Yeah. And if it's aligned, we'll work it out. And if it's not, then decisions have to be made. Yeah. And I'm a big boy, and I accept the fact that sometimes you don't get what you want. You certainly sometimes don't get it from who you want to get it from. And if it comes to a decision where I have to move on, I prepared myself mentally and emotionally to be able to do that. I don't want it to come to that because I am very happy at ESPN doing what I do. I love doing first take every day, uh, every weekday at 10 a.m. I love the other opportunities that potentially could present itself at the Worldwide Leader, but I'm a human being, and everybody wants to be wanted. And I believe them when they say what they say. They've certainly told me what they've told you in fairness to them, and I've always had a great relationship with them. But at the end of the day, they'd be the first to tell me, this is business. So I'm going to be the second to tell everybody else, this is business. And in the end, what it comes down to is whatever opportunities are available. If somebody wants you bad enough, they show you. And by the way, it's not always with money. It's how you're treated. It's the kind of latitude they give you. It's the kind of support that they give you. It's the way they stand up for you and they stand by you. Um, and in my position, those things definitely hold true because I'm a different animal. I've been there for 20 years. You know, with the exception of the two years that I was gone from 2009 to 2011, I've been there for 20 years. I'm a product of the Disney family. And I don't think there's many people that can say that 20 years in, you're number one. But I can. What does that worth? What is that worth? How much does that matter? Those are questions that I have. Yeah. So when you or anybody else comes my way and you're asking those questions, I'm literally looking at you and internalizing, like, what you're asking me for? They're the ones with the power. It's their call. They know what I want. 
They know what I've meant. They know what my value is. They know what I bring to the table. They know how hard I work. They know how committed I've been. They know I'm family. What you gonna do? Mm. We'll see. <laughs> I've been blessed and fortunate to be number one. Last time I checked, the number one sports brand is the NFL. So why shouldn't the number one, one, number one guy on the air be a part of the number one product? That's how I view it. Um, especially since I grew up idolizing Howard Cosell, um, thinking about him and what he brought to the table in terms of his diction, his cadence, his tenor, um, his candor, um, his willingness to tackle issues that most individuals in the industry weren't willing to tackle at that particular moment in time. These are the kind of things that First Take has done. And, and when I say First Take, I'm certainly not talking about myself. I, you know, there are an abundance of people, every single, you know, one of the things that I've said, and I've said this to you before, and I'll say it again, um, I think one of the things that people don't realize, when you think about first take, I don't know if there's a luckier person in the business than me when it comes to first take. Because three years ago when they handed me the baton, after Max Kellerman departed from the show, and they gave it to me, and they asked me to be the, because I didn't ask to be the executive producer. I didn't want that, but they asked me to do it. Every single contributor on the show I went to, and I told them what would be needed. And I don't know if somebody can look at 14 or 15 different people and say, none of them let me down. Right. I mean, they all showed up, every single one of them, male, female, black, white, and everything in between. Every single person that has, has contributed, has been a contributor to First Take, they've all done this for me. And so I wouldn't be sitting up here with you today. I wouldn't have the success that I have on First Take if it were not for all of them. Yeah. I love all of them, and I owe them all a debt of gratitude. And any time I have an opportunity to behind the scenes, it ain't for everybody to know, but I fight for everybody yeah. because they looked out for me. They didn't have to. They were going to do their job. They were going to come on the air, and they were going to, you know, say what they say and all of this other stuff, but they performed. Yeah. And I needed them to do that. And so I wouldn't be sitting up here today in the position that I'm in if it were not for all of them coming together and looking out for me. Because make no mistake about it, whether it's true or not, um, only the bosses can say, but I certainly felt like my career was on the line. That if I was not successful at that particular moment in time with first take, that it would cost me everything. Yeah. And they all came through. And, and, I, and I love them and I appreciate all of them for it. Yeah. Speaking of new opportunities, uh, you know, we've all been following these NBA negotiations. Yep. Uh, and both NBC and ESPN said, in a perfect world, they'd love to have Charles Barkley. Yep. Could you see uh, an NBA countdown, Stephen A and Charles Barkley? Probably not. Um, because Charles Barkley don't want to work that much. <laughs> I'm just telling you what the brother said. I mean, this, these are his words, not mine. That's my man. I love him to death. Charles Barkley, I've seen Charles Barkley walk by executives and say, I never work for y'all asses. Y'all work to people too hard. <laughs> to their face. I've seen him do it. You know, and so, um, you know, for him to be in studio, for him to be a part of the sports centers, pre and post games, the halftime in-betweens and all of this other stuff, multiple days out of the week and stuff like that, I, I can't see it. I would welcome it. I would love it uh, for me and Charles Barkley to be on the set together. That would be a dream come true. But they're all my brothers. I mean, Kenny Smith's brother used to train me, Vincent Smith at Lost Battalion Hall in Queens, New York. Shaq and I go back over 20, 25 years. Um, Ernie Johnson is just phenomenal. He's the greatest. And, and, and imagining him not on the NBA coverage is, is something that should depress all of us. Uh, but. Charles Barkley and I together, oh, you damn right. That's, a, that's absolutely something I would welcome. Yeah. That would be a dream team. I wouldn't say that. I think they already have the dream team with all due respect to them. I mean, it doesn't get much better than Barkley with Kenny Smith and Shaq. Um, I'm certainly not going to go that far, but I believe I can hold my own with anybody. Yeah. So I don't, you know, it is what it is. Barkley and I together on the set. It would be hellacious, but I don't think it would be hellacious. <laughs> I don't think it would be hellacious for us as much as it would be hellacious for the NBA players and coaches. Right. It would be hellacious for them because we ain't going to pull punches. We ain't going to bite our tongues. That's for sure. Uh, Stephen A. has referenced it, but he's also the executive producer of First Take. 
23 straight months of growth to, uh, successful to the point where FS1 uh, how to redo their whole morning lineup. One of the things I love about what you've done at First Take is you've created a feeder system for up and coming talent. You feature people, uh, different people all the time. Monica McNutt, uh, who's gonna be up on the stage in, in a little bit. Kimberly A. Williams, Marcus Spears. You know, to me, they, they really got their first exposure. Kimberly Martin, Jr. Yeah, Jr. sorry. Sure. And talk about that strategy. Well, like I said, I mean, I just think you got to pay attention to the audience. You brought up Monica McNutt. She's yeah. sensational. Everybody think that, you know, she and I got some beef. They don't know me very well. I love her to death. Um, you know, Janae Ogumake, Andrea Carter, Kimberly Martin, Mina Kimes, Molly Kiram, of course. Um, we've, got, we've got a roster full of ladies who have been nothing short of spectacular, and I think they've added a lot to this industry. I don't think they get the respect. Um, and the and the appreciation they deserve because they bring a lot to the table and I think that the thing that I find fascinating and it's not to say that we don't disagree or you know we might not get in heated discussions we might not even be salty with each other for a few minutes thereafter but they ain't gonna last more than a few minutes at the end of the day what people don't understand about a platform like first take is that we're having a problem with the audience is having a problem with us if we disagree if we do agree I'm sorry if we do agree, the objective is tension. The objective is to disagree. The objective is point, counterpoint, opposite points of view. That's what makes the world go around. That's what it's supposed to be. And so when people are of the mindset that it's not supposed to be that way, they're a bit clueless in that regard. It's supposed to be a little tension. And sometimes, in fairness, I've had to talk to the bosses about that. If they've disagreed with something that I've said or whatever, I'd literally look at them like, so? Who told you we were supposed to agree? You put me on a platform to say something you might disagree with. That's what makes it go. As long as I'm not crossing third rails and being flagrantly insensitive or anything like that, what is the problem? Who told you that I go on the air for you to agree with me? No, I'm going on the air to say something and provide a perspective that's factual, uh, that has a, an appropriate line, that's not being crossed, but that also makes you think that you might be wrong, that makes you think of something differently than you may have been thinking about it. That's why we've got whites and blacks and Asian and Hispanics and everybody else, because everybody's coming from a different lens than you might be coming from, and everybody is fed. That's why it was so important for me to have that potpourri of individuals coming through the show time and time and time again. Because anytime you tune in the first take, you don't know what you're going to get more than more. You know I'm going to be there. You know I'm going to stir the cup. But you don't know who I'm going up against, what they're going to say, what kind of perspective that they're going to, they're going to provide to elevate and edify the mindset of the audience watching us. And that is what it's all about. And so for me, you know, to me, it's like I got great producers on the show. They do most of the work. My primary responsibility as executive producer of the show is I'm the one who determines the roster. And I'm the one that's going to determine the rundown at the end of the day. But all that other work that comes with it, that's all them. I only care about that content and who are the individuals volleying back and forth, creating perspectives for all of you to consider. Yeah. You've talked about the possibility of moving into politics, news, acting, as we all know, your brick on General Hospital, yeah. your, your favorite brick. soap. What does the future hold for Stephen A? Um, it's going to be a little more acting. You know, uh, General Hospital is, you know, trying to create some love interest. I like being a mobster. <laughs> I like being, you know, the surveillance expert for the mob, you see? But they, you know, all of a sudden, they did some focus groups or whatever, and they talking about a love interest, and I'm like, eh. Uh -huh. All right, you know, if you must. Uh -huh. But that's not really where my interest lies. But I, I, I've been, what I've loved about, and I'm no actor. They think I am, but I don't think I am. What I loved about, what I loved, what I've discovered that I love about it, though, is that you can get away with being whatever the role says you are, no matter what. If that's what the role says it is, everybody will forgive you because you're acting. So I mean, I was like, oh, I, I can get away with this. I can get away with that. Okay. Mm. So that excites me about it in that regard. Um, politics, no, people have asked me about that. I'm not interested in any politics. I like talking about it. I like talking about uh, providing social commentary and talking about the issues that are pertinent to 
my community and America as a whole, that interests me, but nothing further than that. Yeah. I don't, I like talking about it. I have no desire, zero, to run for office. I like my life. I ain't trying to be in that cesspool, so no. That's not yeah. true, that's not true. But I, I'm enjoying acting more. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm, I'm fascinated by um, building my own production company. I've hired a couple of more people. I've got more people coming on board. Um, and I'm about to try to take this by storm. There's people that I'm in the process of collaborating with. There are people down the pike that I will be collaborating with. And I'm really, really excited about that. I'm very excited about my YouTube show because that's not going away. My YouTube show and my podcast, I'm going to be doing that for years to come. I might amp it up to five days a week for all I know. I mean, I just don't get tired of it. I don't know how to explain it, uh, but I like to work. I like to be on my grind. I like people. I like the thought of people trying to go up against me and thinking that they can handle the schedule that I handle. I like that. I, I want to see if they can pull it off, how long they can. I like that stuff. Um, but also in a perfect world, um, I'll maintain doing what I've been doing because we've established something really, really great and really special with First Take. And, you know, in my perfect world, I I'd like to keep that going. We'll see what happens. But again, doing NBA Countdown on ABC, that's likely. Doing Monday Night Countdown is something that I want to do. Um, and, and come hella high water, I intend to pull it off. And hopefully it'll be where I'm at. If it's not, it's not. Yeah. Well, Stephen A., thank you for your time. Please join me in a round of applause. The NBA would consider running back the play that left them in their current most challenging ownership situation. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver said that the league would consider allowing the Celtics to be sold to one ownership group over multiple years, gradually phasing in a new regime to one of the league's most storied franchises. For instance, a new owner could purchase 20% of the team at a time until they had at least majority control. There's a lot to like about that way of doing things. It can help the buyer secure a huge sum of cash over time, which could allow for more favorable terms. It also creates a defined transition period instead of a single day when everything changes. However, it also introduces new things that can go wrong, as we are seeing right now in Minnesota. In 2021, Glenn Taylor agreed to sell the Timberwolves and Lynx to Alex Rodriguez and Mark Laurie at a $1.5 billion valuation. So far, A-Rod and Lori have 40% of the team, but the two sides are locked in a legal battle over the next payment, which would give them majority control because the buying group missed a payment and Taylor realized he sold for too low. With a longer sale process, there is more time for buyer's remorse, seller's remorse, legal or financial snags, and other challenges to get in the way. That said, there are some easy lessons to learn from the Minnesota saga. Namely, if you're going to approve a team sale, make sure the buyers definitely have the cash. Chelsea has been playing at Stamford Bridge since their founding in 1905, 87 years before the founding of the Premier League. Now they're thinking about finding a new home. The team is looking to swap out over a century of history for a major increase in capacity. Their current home can hold about 40,000 fans. Tottenham Hotspur, by comparison, opened their new stadium five years ago and can beat Chelsea by about 50% with a capacity of 62,850. Last year, according to Deloitte, Tottenham brought in $149 million in match day revenue, while Chelsea earned a comparatively small $897 million. Chelsea was purchased by Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital two years ago for $5.4 billion. This will be perhaps the most defining decision of the new regime. The Manning cast hit an all-time low in ratings on their season opening simulcast of Monday Night Football. Breaking news reporter Alex Schiffer joins the show to explain why the Manning brothers slumped on Monday and whether or not they can bounce back. That conversation is up next. I'm joined now by Breaking News and Enterprise reporter Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Alex. Always a pleasure, Owen. What's going on? Hey, hey, great to have you on. Um, so the NFL had phenomenal ratings for its first week with one notable exception, that being the Manning cast. Uh, give us a story here. What happened? Yeah, I mean, the, the Manning cast drew an all-time bad rating of about, or, or low rating of about, you know, 840,000 840, uh, viewers. You know, it was kind of teetering on uh, on like a million last year, and it, it came in with a with a drop. And you know, there's a couple of things to consider here. You know, um, I, I think there's a Directv outage right now for about 11 million customers with ESPN over their negotiations. And personally, and this isn't my Jets fandom coming up, but I thought Bill Belichick was not very engaging as a debut guest. You know, he had no chemistry with the brothers. I, I didn't find him very insightful. Um, 
they kept interrupting each other. D- does that all change? I'm kind of curious to see that going forward, but uh, I've kind of wondered a bit if that maybe didn't help. Yeah, I mean, there's like a, a few threads there. I mean, the direct TV thing, if that cost them 100,000 viewers, wouldn't be a huge shock. And also, um, you know, you add those back in and we're not really having those this conversation. Belichick, I, I wouldn't watch. I was actually at the game. Very exciting. Um, but um, uh, so I wasn't watching the Manning cast. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, like, does he have chemistry with with the people he's working with? Clearly, he knows a lot about the game, but you know, you can know a lot and not have the like kind of easy banter of the Manning brothers have with each other of you know growing up together and uh, competing against each other. So, um, yeah, I mean, it'll just be interesting to see. I do wonder if people were just kind of excited for football and wanted the mainstream broadcast week one and will kind of slide back into checking out the Manning cast as, as football season settles in. But I guess it'll just be a kind of a wait and see thing anyway. Yeah. You know, I've kind of wanted to obviously quarterbacks is the Manning family's MO and nothing on Aaron Rodgers versus Brock Purdy, but I feel like, you know, even though Brock Purdy has been really good with the Niners, I see he's still not Patrick Mahomes or um, CJ Stroud or I don't know, he, he, you know, he played at Iowa State. It's not like he had this huge uh, following coming up into the draft or anything. Like, I've kind of wondered, like, could that have been a thing? You know, to your point, DirecTV has 11 million subscribers. You just take a sliver of that and put it on the Manning cast, and it, we're probably not talking about this. So it is going to be interesting. I'm, I'm curious, too, if, if the Bill Belichick situation improves just because ESPN's paying him all this money. You know, what if he just doesn't get better on air, just doesn't care? He, he's already rich. I mean, he only has so many reasons to care. So I'm, I'm really kind of curious to see how he develops as a broadcaster and, and as this plug-and-play guest that they're using him as, given that, to me, it hasn't been that great of a start. With Brady, I feel like, I know he's on Fox, but with Brady, I feel like he's got this what, 10-year deal, uh, which he's, you know, he said he's, he's committed to. And, you know, he, even if he was, like, a little stiff in his first go-round, you know, uh, I, I'm not too worried about him. He's, he's going to get into the swing of things before too long. Belichick wants to coach next year, uh, if the reporting is accurate. And so how committed is he to, like, you know, figuring out his his banter and his timing and all that? We'll see. I mean, maybe, like, he'll just, with some reps, he'll get used to it. Maybe not. Um, but, uh, but, but, yeah, and obviously the carriage dispute with DirecTV will probably end at some point because we are in football season and it's not helping Disney or DirecTV to have 11 million people shut off from the most popular product in America. But, um, but they, they didn't resolve it for the first week. So we'll see, I guess. Yeah. To your point of the Belichick thing, you know, we just saw Doc Rivers join ESPN's NBA booth and then be out before the season was over with a, a new coaching job. So, you know, obviously there's a ton of money behind Tom Brady. He's done playing. Um, he's a much different deal. Bill Belichick is, you know, at least, in my opinion, just kind of, you know, has to collect a check for a season until he can maybe get his name out of the jobs. And it's not to knock him or, uh, or anything, but to me, just kind of the truth. Like he, we, we don't expect this to be a multi-year thing. Assuming he gets one more chance somewhere. And that's why it's just like, if you're him, like, you know, and also how I was thinking about this while watching the broadcast and him being boring to me, like how much are you going to give away your show of your own real insights? If there's a world in which you're still coaching next year too. So like, I've kind of wondered how he's walking that line internally and, and all that stuff. So, um, so his development or, or lack thereof, and is there a world in which that, you know, the, the man, it's like the Ewing theory, right? With, you know, you're better without your best player sometimes. Like, like, is he, are the, are the broadcast better without him and how do they kind of remedy that if that's the case is, is kind of an interesting thing to watch and, and wonder about. He's got so much knowledge, you figure there has to be, you know, a world where he's a huge ad for, for the shows he's on. Um, but yeah, that's, it's kind of up to him if he can deliver on that promise and, and I guess if he wants to, I think he would want to show how smart he is, you know, kind of J.J. Redick style. But obviously, he's coached for a long time. He's a legend. J.J. Redick has never coached quite yet. Um, and so different situations. But you, you'd think he'd want to show people like uh, still a good brain working up in here, even if the Pats weren't so good the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, we'll see you in week two. Alex Schiffer, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Owen. Marty Smith is practically synonymous with college football as one of ESPN's lead reporters on the sport. He joins the show to give his takes on NIL, the transfer portal, and conference realignment, and that conversation is next. 
Very excited to be joined now by Marty Smith, ESPN host and reporter. Welcome, Marty. Appreciate you, Owen. Thank you guys so much for having me today. Big fan of what y'all do over there. Yeah, likewise. Great to have you on. So we're two weeks into the college football season. What stands out to you so far? A lot of things stand out to me so far. First of all, uh, just how wide open this particular season is. There's already been some unbelievable surprises. There's been some upsets. Uh, we've seen teams that we believe were going to be absolutely dominant, barely squeak by, but but do so unscathed so far. Oregon comes to mind in that regard. Dan Lanning's program is amazing. His team is very good, but they've been challenged the first couple weeks, which uh, I'm sure in his mind he hopes that as they progress deeper into the Big Ten schedule, their team will be uh, – his team will, will feel as if they've – been battle tested and emerged, but it's been a hell of a season so far already. We got some coaches who are wondering about, you know, the hot seat. We're hearing their names in that that perspective and and from that regard. So it is wide open, man. And the the twelve team playoff is already in play. And so I just think it's a fantastic first couple of weeks. Obviously, we've had some massive structural changes in the college landscape. Those are still playing out. Is there anything, I know it's you know pretty risky making any big conclusions about this two weeks in, but do you see any of those structural changes sort of affecting, you think, what we're seeing on the field? Let's just start with realignment. I think specifically in the Southeastern Conference and the Big Ten, it will. it's actually now harder to win the conference than it is to make the playoff. Those used to be, in, in so many cases, intertwined in a lot of ways. Now, we've certainly seen in the past where teams were admitted to the playoff that didn't win the conference, but it was a big indicator, if you did, that you probably were going to have an opportunity. I look at some of the schedules in the SEC are so merciless. You know, Georgia, I feel like, could lose two games this season and still be a playoff team. And that certainly wasn't the case in the past when it was a four-team playoff. So I think from that perspective, conference realignment, broadening the conference and doing away with divisions make it harder to win the SEC, but more teams are going to make the playoff than would have in the past. So I do feel like that's kind of uh, uh, taken on a new life. Now, NIL, transfer portal, all of those things are, it's still the Wild West. It is. And that's going to be the case until there's some sort of uniform governance, which there's not. And until there is, uh, it, we're just going to continue to see a transactional college football. That's what it is now. It's transactional. You don't see a lot of times where at the end of a season, players are now going into the coach's office saying, hey, coach, Man, I want, to, I want to see the damn football field. What do I have to do in order to develop to a degree where you think I'm going to have an opportunity to play and maximize my skill? They're now walking in going, Coach, how much you paying me? And that's a very different college football than it was even a handful of years ago. So there are certainly anomalies there. There's Carson Beck at the University of Georgia who waited his turn and is now a Heisman candidate and potentially – a number one pick coming up in the next NFL draft. And then, you know, conversely, you have a guy like Dylan Gabriel who started at UCF, went to Oklahoma. He's now at Oregon and guys hopping around all over the place. So it's just, it's a unique time. I'm all for player empowerment. That is uh, wonderful. But I do think there needs to be some uniformity here. Yeah. I mean, I think that exact dichotomy is what makes a lot of people uncomfortable or just not quite sure what to do with all this because um yeah player empowerment is great you know these kids getting paid while they're able to you know in in what can be a short career or for many of them a non-career in football um you know that's great too uh, at the same time you know it feels like there is something being lost when yeah it's it's more just like okay i'm not not you know maximizing my you know potential right now in like my sophomore and my junior year um so i'm gonna switch schools i'm gonna go to the place that has the better nil program um or yeah where there's a starting role obviously um and of course we've got this house settlement that's you know not finalized right now a judge just threw it back to 
the the two parties saying you know I, and i think her her argument was basically this settlement as currently written is putting too much of a cap on nil dollars yes you're now just paying the payers players directly but um but let's not cap them in terms of what they can make uh off you know through endorsements and the like um I'm wondering what you feel should be the goals of, you know, some kind of uniform system that we're glacially moving toward. No, no, no idea, man. I mean, I, because no conference commissioners are going, that nobody's giving. Like there, there's this, there's no give and take here in order for uh, conferences to agree on that uniformity. So it's probably going to have to come from, a higher level, whether that's Congress, the NCAA, I don't know. But we're in a position now where if I'm Greg Sankey or if I'm Brett Your Market to Big 12, whomever, you name it, power four commissioner, I'm going to fight for every single thing that benefits my league. I don't care about your league. I care about my league and my student athletes and my coaches and my member institutions. So that's what we're seeing here, Owen. We're not seeing a whole bunch of, you know what, let's reach across the aisle, kumbaya, let's do, no, -uh. no, sir. I'm looking out for me. Now, when it comes to NIL and trying to raise money, that's kind of where all these schools are trying to figure out unique ways to do that. And you have major institutions in the Big Ten and the SEC that have these colossal television agreements where there's revenue sharing coming at the player level. And that's beneficial to those institutions. What game change does quickly, if you're a sport, if you're a college athletics fan, you go to gogamechange.com, you input your credit or debit card, you pick the school to which you want to donate, and every single purchase you make with that credit or debit card is automatically rounded up to the next dollar, and the difference goes directly to the school you chose. So, and it goes right to the athletic department. And it's an easy way to do it. You don't have to spend millions of dollars, put your name on a building, because that's what we're seeing now, Owen, with there is donor fatigue in a lot of cases because when you have these folks at the big, big institutions that are like, oh, yeah, hey, I'll give $5 million. You're going to put my name on a building. Well, now in the NIL era, that university wants your $5 million again. Yeah, I mean, I do wonder um... – it's kind of what the numbers are going to look like in five, 10 years, because yeah, maybe, you know, in the, this first rush of NIL, it's like, okay, like this quarterback wants $2 million. All right. You know, let's, let's pull some strings, call in some favors and do it. But what if that's, what if that's every year or every two or three years? It's, it's like, going all to right. Be if they're good boss. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, if I'm a donor to a school and you know, I'm very, very fortunate. Um, yeah, maybe I can do that once, twice, maybe, you know, once every five to 10 years. But if I'm just supposed to be, you know, like the the team owner of a professional team, essentially, where I'm just doling out money um, and but not having the benefits of the owner of, you know, getting some of that revenue back and or, you know, eventually being able to sell the team. Obviously, none of that's on the table here. So, yeah, I, it doesn't feel that end doesn't feel all that sustainable. Completely agree. Talk about it all the time. Every single speech that I do, I do a lot of motivational speaking. And any time that I open it up to questions when I'm done with the formal address, it's the very first thing that's asked. What do you think about NIL, transfer portal, conference realignment, expanded playoff, on and on? Well, it's where we are. So now we're in the phase of trying to figure out how to make it sustainable. Because I just... As you look at it right now, I mean, you look at these young, these great young quarterbacks that are coming in, all right? You got Arch Manning, who Quinn Ewers played out of his mind against the Michigan Wolverines last Saturday. That young man is special. You look at Carson Beck, Nico Iamaleava at the University of Tennessee. He's got a big number now, and he's only a sophomore. Next year, it's going to be a real big number. And so that's where we are. And the schools are doing their very best to figure out how to manage that. And so it is a, u, a unique new era of college football. And everybody's kind of living day-to-day, -day, learning how to manage it.
Yeah. And if you, you know, if the someone in the college football world said, you know, Marty Smith, we want you to run one of these programs, where would you want to be? Would you want to be one of the top schools? Are they still just the best positioned? Or is it, or is it better right now in well, some ways to be one of the sort of mid tier where like maybe the expectations aren't so high, the, you know, dollar expectations aren't so high? Where, where's the comfort zone if there is one? I don't know that that exists because you look at, again, going back to my alma mater, Radford University, there are member institutions in the Big South Conference in which Radford competes that have mid to larger six-figure budgets for their men's basketball team, for example, and that's in the Big South Conference. So if you look at, all right, just look at Florida State working as hard as it can to get out of the Atlantic Coast Conference because their grant of rights with ESPN offers them so much less money annually than what the Big Ten and SEC schools now will accrue. And so it's an arms race. And the arms race is Journalism 101, Owen, follow the money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's what drove realignment. Um, it's, it's, I mean, that's what's, what's driving all of this. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk of like, eventually this is all because like the money is just kind of, it seems like it keeps getting more and more centralized. Like we had the power five. Now we've got the power four because one of those, those schools couldn't, one of those conferences couldn't hold on, you know, now that could happen to the ACC, you know, if uh, Florida leaves, Clemson leaves, maybe that sparks another exodus. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's some talk of like, we just have like the paid super conference and the less paid or something else, you know, basically FBS and FCS. It feels like maybe we're headed toward that. But uh, again, like we have all these different entities, every different conference is going to be fighting for what's best for them and every school and and obviously it's all changing. So I feel like there's maybe some kind of logical conclusion we could get to, but to get there, we would have to, you know, get everyone on the same page. That's the challenge, brother. That, I mean, truly that's the challenge. And, and at this moment, it's not just conferences, it's state by state governance. And so there are laws being passed in select states that are beneficial to their member institutions within their borders that allow them the opportunity to do things that other states can't financially. And so until there's uniformity and oversight from a national perspective, it's, I mean, it's the wild west. All right. We spent a lot of time in the thorns here, the weeds. Uh, what are you excited about this season? Obviously there a lot of intrigue already, but you know, what gets your heart racing in a good way uh, when it comes to this season? I just think that there's, it, 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 despite everything we just said, this is such an exciting college football season. I'm fascinated by the quarterback play. Uh, I think there's a ton of parity. Uh, I see, even though we're, you know, we're talking about the financial discrepancies between this school, that state, et cetera, you look at some of these schools that are doing so well and have the potential for very special seasons, maybe a playoff run, and what that would mean for them. And I just think it's uh, – it's very exciting. I love to see Texas and Oklahoma in the SEC. It is sort of weird that Southern Cal at Rutgers is going to be a conference game and that kind of thing, but it'll, we'll get used to it. It's just what, what will that become uh, for, for schools that aren't revenue-generating uh, sports? Who knows? But – it's just a really exciting time, I think, certainly in football. Uh, I'm really enjoying this season, and I feel like the expanded playoff adds so much to that intrigue as we go. Because, again, one loss doesn't kill you. Yeah, it should be interesting to see how this all plays out. Marty Smith, really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for joining us in the show. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks for having me, man. Steph Curry is making his intentions known that he wants an NBA or WNBA team after he retires. Asked about owning a team at Bloomberg's Power Players event in New York, Steph said, for sure, and I'll be keeping an eye on how the expansion process works. 
he added he's interested in both NBA and WNBA teams. Retired players owning more than a nominal share of a team is a rarity in most sports because they make millions, not billions. However, a few forces may be coming together to change that. For starters, the top players are seeing salaries that would have been unimaginable a decade ago. Steph will make $62.6 million in 2026-27 after signing a one-year extension this offseason. That will make him the fourth player in league history to earn over half a billion dollars on the court, along with LeBron, Durant, and Paul George. And his salary is only half the equation. Forbes estimates that Curry earned $50 million from endorsements and other off-court sources in the 12 months ending in May. With team valuations also skyrocketing, it's still hard to imagine Curry becoming a majority owner of an NBA team shortly after he retires, but he might be able to do something along the lines of what Derek Jeter had with the Miami Marlins, with a significant stake and a substantial role in team operations. If he wants a WNBA team, he has the funds to be a majority owner right now. UFC is looking to max out on the first fight in the Las Vegas sphere. The venue is mostly known for its visually immersive concerts, but it will get its first combat sports event this weekend with a 10-fight card that UFC president Dana White said is costing over $16 million to produce. The promotion is looking to make it back in tickets, with initial prices ranging from $2,257 to $17,507 for the priciest floor seats. Those figures have been slipping recently as UFC looks to fill out the arena. However this one goes, UFC is sure to keep pushing as far as it can with marquee events at record prices. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, feel free to share it with a friend or a colleague you think would like it too. And if you want to reach out to us, send an email to today at frontofficesports.com and you could be featured on the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.